I'm going to turn this over to Mayor Bisson tonight before we begin tonight's meeting. So aloha laina. First of all, thank you everybody for coming tonight. This is a very important topic. And um, so I just want to get really to the speakers and the experts. Let us try to answer a lot of the questions that we think you folks have. Uh, and then feel free to submit those questions so that we can get to them. We're going to have some folks present um, from a variety of, of uh, disciplines or subject matter experts. So I just wanted to welcome you here. And uh, I see we have questions, um, some documents. We'll send some people through the audience to pick up those forms. So we'll start with a slide presentation and then get to the speakers. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to talk a little bit about how tonight is going to work. First of all, aloha and welcome. I'm Mahina Martin with the County of Maui. Happy to be a moderator tonight and super happy to see all of you here. We hope tonight we'll be able to share information with you. It is being live streamed on the County of Maui Facebook page, which means you can go back and watch it after should you need to recall something or if you want to invite others as well. So please don't feel like you need to keep writing notes or anything. It will stay on our county uh, social media page. And if you need a link to the video, we're happy to email it to you as well. We'll give you that email address at the very end. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, lineup that we're going to have. And Zeke Kalua is our sound guy. So hopefully I won't squelch the microphone. And we welcome all of you here this evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a few items. First and foremost, what phase are we in in this important step in the, in the cleanup of Lahaina with debris removal and that process? The phase, we've, we're ahead of schedule on some parts of it, and we're happy to be ahead of schedule. That also means that we have to move a little faster on some other things that we were uh, not anticipating to be as quick as uh, coming here. As far as the next step, we'll be talking a little bit or having the Army Corps of Engineers share about the removal of debris and ash. What does that mean? What is the difference between a temporary containment site and a permanent containment site? These are all important because they're two different stages and as we complete the ahead of schedule re-entry of 83 zones, we are ready to begin the next phase, which is debris removal. Then we'll invite up from our county uh, Department of Environmental Management, Director Shane Agawa. Some of you may know him because he's a Oluwalu boy, but he's also head of our uh, Department of Environmental Management. They are in charge on behalf of the county for the final containment site. So you'll be hearing from different folks from the uh, FEMA, from the Federal Emergency Management Agency tonight, Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the County of Maui, to give you as much information as we can this evening. Then we're going to take questions, and we're going to do it this way, because there are so many of you, we realize, wow, this is, a, this is a, an amazing turnout, just hundreds of you, and we appreciate your time. We've received a number of questions over time. We're going to hope that these folks can give you some good uh, sharing of information. When you walked in, you got a blue sheet and a pink sheet. You can either give us just some comments you want us to consider as we go through the planning for the debris containment and removal. You can also give us a question this evening. I suggest uh, maybe waiting to hear what our folks have to say first and that might help you, uh, they may already answer your question. When you do have your question, we'll ask you to raise your paper and one of our Kokua crew will run and grab it from you and bring it up. Uh, and again, I encourage you to uh, hear the presentation first because they may already answer the question you may have. Tonight, we're gonna be sharing some information. Our speakers are Mark Wingate from FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Colonel Jesse Curry, if you've been coming to our Wednesday meetings here in Lahaina, you probably met them along the way. We're also inviting, as I said, Director Shane Agawa, who heads the Environmental Management Department for the County of Maui. There is no final site for the final containment that has yet been determined. I just want to share that with you because I know that's like a burning question. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're going to hear a little bit about how we had a proposed project. 
why we were moved so quickly because we were ahead of schedule, what that proposed site would look like as a proposed site. But you'll also hear that we've been looking at several sites. So I just want to make sure everyone's really clear about that. Many of you, how many of you raise your hand if you took the survey from Lahaina Strong? All right, terrific. Lahaina Strong, one of your most respected grassroots organizations here in the West Maui, took the initiative and put out a survey about debris management and the cleanup. To date, I understand from Paele before this meeting, they sent out to 5,000 people yesterday, sorry for the last minute, uh, but they so far got 812 responses. Amazing. We're going to look at those 812 responses. We are also going to be participating in a community forum with Lahaina Strong. So the County of Maui and whoever they invite to join us will come before you for an open forum on any question you want. But tonight, tonight specifically, we are talking about debris removal because it's so important. So if you haven't filled out the survey, which Paele? I think they're going to send it out one more time, right? Or you can still do it again. Okay, so we want you to participate in their survey. Our outcome tonight is to collect your feedback, provide information, take your questions, and help us get through this stage, okay? At this time, I'm gonna bring up um, from FEMA, Mark Wingate, who's gonna talk a little bit about the stage we're at and what's involved, Mark. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Thank you, Mahina. Um, you guys have been through a lot, so I appreciate the opportunity to provide context and take questions at the end. Uh, EPA has completed, I'll say it this way, their portion of the hazardous materials, okay? The removal from upcountry and Lahaina properties. The hazardous materials uh, associated with residential properties includes things like paint, solvents, fertilizers, pesticides, uh, propane tanks. You might think about, you know, what you might find in your garage, okay? That's uh, a good cross-section of the phase one hazardous materials the lion's share of which have been removed from upcountry in Lahaina. Um, this is a very short duration part of the mission. It does not include heavy equipment. It's whatever EPA could, could take by hand in a few hours. Um, during phase one, they found some properties to be too dangerous to enter because of structural hazards. Uh, so, th those hazardous materials will therefore be removed during phase two by the Corps of Engineers. So, before we go on to phase two, I want to uh, report happily that the U.S. Coast Guard has retrieved 87 destroyed vessels from the harbor and they have also reunited most of the floating vessels with their respective owners. So back to phase two, the debris removal in upcountry is well underway since 7 November, and the Corps of Engineers is about halfway through that mission, okay? Um, In Lahaina, we haven't started debris removal yet. We have to have a place to put it. We are working on a temporary debris storage site. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank you for submitting your rights of entry. We can't do that work until we get those. Um, and for added context, I want to say a couple of things about the debris itself 
during phase two, okay? Normally, fire, private property, debris removal missions that, excuse me, FEMA participates in funding are limited to removing ash, burned household items, and uh, hazards to work crews such as hazardous trees and precariously perched structural elements. But for this event, we added an objective to expedite economic recovery, okay? So to that end, we added cars, vessels, foundations, commercial properties, demolition, soil sampling, and excavation of that soil when we exceed actionable thresholds. So just to uh, repeat what I said earlier about we are working on having a place to put the debris as we speak and uh, to that end I'll turn this over to Colonel Curry. All right, thank you Mark and mahalo for, for having us here tonight again as was stated earlier I'm Colonel Jess Curry uh, from the US Army Corps of Engineers I command what's called the Recovery Field Office, which is on the ground here on Maui every day, leading all efforts for the Corps of Engineers as part of this, uh, this historic recovery. So a couple things that, that we've been asked to speak about tonight, um, clearly we'll reach back into a little bit of what Mr. Wingate briefed on, but also we'll look forward as to what is, uh, what is to come. Um, one of the questions that has been asked is to describe a bit about what will be removed. Uh, so, and what is, what is there on the ground uh, in Lahaina, and then what the Corps of Engineers is tasked to remove, similar to what uh, Mr. Wingate just described. So, within that debris, as you know, there's a tremendous amount of material. So, a lot of that is recyclable material. It's steel, other metals, uh, recyclable concrete. All those will be removed uh, as part of our debris mission. When all that is removed from those locations, then the ash can be removed, uh, as well as any impacted materials, soil, impacted concrete. But again, that is all within the scope of what, uh, what FEMA has asked the Corps of Engineers to do here in Lahaina. As we, as we look at the amount of how much that will be, it is a significant amount. The goal throughout all is for all recyclable materials to be recycled to go to facilities here on Maui so that that can be, be reused, be environmentally friendly, friendly as much as possible. Um, so that, that is absolutely the goal for all those materials that can be recycled. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a significant amount of available recyclable material uh, that, we, that will be removed. Uh, the ash and the impacted material, as discussed, does also need a place to go, which I know is a, is a major reason we're here uh, speaking with you tonight to help describe where where that will go both on a temporary basis and then also potentially on a permanent basis. I want to emphasize that the the Corps of Engineers is tasked with building the temporary debris storage site. Emphasis on the temporary. The purpose of the temporary debris storage site is to take material that currently is in an, that is contaminated and is in an uncontrolled environment and to get that material out of that uncontrolled environment into a controlled environment. The reason that that is urgent is for the protection of the environment, is to ensure that we reduce the risk to, to all the things that this community cares about, that we all care about, uh, to the, all the environmental, environmental things around us that are really a treasure for this island, is to protect those by, again, taking uncontrolled contaminated material and getting it into a controlled environment as quickly as we can. Additionally, as we do that, we're also setting the stage as quickly as possible for the next steps uh, for Lahaina to rebuild. You know, certainly there is an urgency there as well, so we want to work to do that as expeditiously as possible. I do want to speak a few minutes about the process uh, for those that want to understand or you have a, you have a property 
that uh, is either in the, in the program or you're considering whether submitting a right of entry to be a part of the federal program. Certainly we have a team and many teams that are, that are here every day that, uh, that are available to answer any questions. And the emphasis would be at the beginning that every property is unique. You know, there's, there's a lot of variations, there's a lot of things that we have to consider, but we want to ensure we have those conversations. That, start, that process is started when the, our, the right of entry form is filled out and the information you put in there uh, for that particular property starts that discussion, but it doesn't end there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, as I talk about the process for removal of debris and ash. So as we, as we begin the removal of debris and ash for phase two in Lahaina, there, you will see a mobilization of our crews. Those crews will be made up of some heavy equipment, of course. Um, there is gonna be a, ter a tremendous amount of hand removal of material where there's in sensitive areas, but there will also be skid steers and excavators and other equipment that will be necessary first to, to get that recyclable material and get it to the recycling centers, but then also to remove the ash and debris. As they make their, as they start to mobilize, uh, we will be mobilized and really focused on three types of properties. The first is residential, which is the, the largest number of those properties in Lahaina, are the residential properties. And then commercial and public properties is the second category. And then the final category is for historic public properties. We recognize there's a tremendous amount of history and culture that is, that is here in Lahaina. And our goal throughout the process is to address what, what has been unfortunately destroyed, but also to protect what's still there to the maximum extent possible. Part of that is all of this work will be, will be overwatched by cultural observers, uh, cultural archeologists that will be on every site. They will be monitoring this work as it continues to move forward and as those things, whether, we, whether we, had, we knew about it because we had it on the right of entry and we've talked to, the, talked to the owners of that particular property or we find something throughout the process, those, those individuals are there to ensure that we react appropriately. In most cases, it will be to stop work and to assess what, uh, what is on that property as it moves forward. But really, really important to emphasize that part of this process that we are committed to even in the event that it does take more time, is to ensure that, that those protections will remain in place from the first property to the last property, with no exceptions in between. The continued process as we, as we mobilize those crews, for those that, for those that um, again, have, have seen some of the, the damages that, uh, that occurred, unfortunately, a lot of trees um, were damaged to the point where they are now a, a significant hazard to not only the safety of our crews, but then would be a, a hazard to rebuilding on those locations. So part of the process will be to go in and to make those properties safe as they do, as they do the, before they do the debris removal. So removal of those hazard trees, part of our initial phase one assessments was certified arborists to come out and evaluate every single one of those trees and determine which ones, what, what of those trees uh, do pose a hazard to, again, the debris removal process, but also to the rebuilding on those properties. We'll also, they will go through and clear uh, vehicles and vessels and bring those off the property. We will be properly uh, adjudicated. And what that means is all the necessary steps that need to take place for insurance, for, for again, those, those vehicles, those things that, again, need to, need to go through a, a process to ensure that they're accounted for. So insurance claims can be can be properly done. All those steps will be taken uh, as these vehicles and vessels are taken off the property and before they go, for, in most cases, to, to recycling uh, to the maximum extent possible. At that point, we will then begin with the removal of the remaining uh, recyclable material and then start, once that's done, start with the actual ash and debris removal. And for most of the properties in Lahaina, once the recyclable material is gone, once the uh, vehicles and vessels are gone, there, there's, there is unfortunately not going to be a tremendous amount of material left. Um, it will be the ash, it will be the contaminated soil, and potentially the, the other contaminated concrete and foundation. So at that point, 
the, the excavation crews will come in and they will, they will take off six inches, of, six inches of soil that has been contaminated from within the, the ash footprint of the structure. They'll also come in and they'll remove the, remove the foundation uh, and take all that out and, uh, and haul it away, which I'll talk about that process in a minute. Once, the, once that is complete, then we will do the environmental testing that Mr. Wingate mentioned earlier. If at that point, the, all the readings come back as below action level, then, then there will be no more excavation on that particular property. And we will, we will come back and we will backfill uh, three inches. We removed six, we will backfill three inches in those areas with gravel or cinder or some, sim, similar type material that will enable that particular owner the, the best advantage when they want to come back and rebuild and reestablish that structure. Um, once, if, if the results do come back as, as being contamination above action level, the portions of that property where those samples were taken will then be, will then be scraped to another six inches. There will, no, there will, in no situation will we remove more debris or more, more, do a greater scrape than a total of 12 inches. That is the max of our, of our, of our guidance, of our authority to remove the, the material from any property in Lahaina is we stop at that 12 inch, 12 inch uh, maximum. We anticipate that, that we won't have to go that far we, we, on all properties for sure. I mean, we're hopeful that it won't be, it won't be a high percentage of those properties that will require what we would call a rescrape. So once that is complete, then again, we go to backfill and the process is, the process is done. All the, all the information that was contained in that entire process will be packaged and, and provided back to, back to FEMA and to the county. Um, I'll, I'll talk a quick minute about, again, I talked a lot about how the, how the material is coming off the property, but I didn't talk about how it is driving away from the property. So we have a process uh, that we have been using up in Kula. It's been very successful, um, and it's called, it's called burrito wrapping. And essentially, if, you've, if a dump truck or roll-off container is wrapped with, with very thick plastic, the material goes into that plastic in the back of the container, and it is wrapped to the point where it is, it is encapsulated. It cannot, you know, the, the material will be, very, will be wet because we will be using wet methods to keep the, the, the dust and ash from getting into the air. But that, that wrap will encapsulate that material to ensure that as it drives down the road and makes its way to, to the temporary to restore site, it's not leaking. There's no, there's no ash, possibility for ash to get into the air as it makes its way out of Lahaina and to the temporary to restore site. At, at this time, we are in still the traffic planning process to determine the exact routes that the, those trucks will take out of Lahaina. What I can tell you that on its way to the, where the TDS site is currently being constructed in Oluwalu, uh, there, right now we anticipate there's gonna be really only one crossing point over the highway. It will, can, it will move down Front Street all the way as far down, uh, as far down towards the temporary restored site as it can. We'll cross over the highway and then we'll be on another frontage road that actually our, our temporary restored site uh, contractor is beginning the process now to reinforce and widen that haulage road. So that there will be a traffic impact at that particular location. That will be, there will, we will establish a light that will be manually operated and we will continually work to mitigate and minimize the impacts as much as possible as those trucks uh, come, out of, come out of Lahaina. There will be a lot of trucks um, as you can anticipate. So again, I, I certainly will not pretend that there's not gonna be an impact but uh, we will work to mitigate and minimize that, work with the county to as much as can possibly be done. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk through again is the temporary debris storage site. So just emphasizing the purpose for the temporary debris storage site is as rapidly as possible for us to address the environmental hazards that are currently on the ground uh, in Lahaina and get those into a controlled environment. So the temporary debris storage site is under construction today. It has been under construction for, for a few weeks now. It is, it is templated to be complete uh, by, the, by early February. And that's complete construction of the temporary debris storage site. We do anticipate and we are pushing to, for our contractor to be able to start receiving at that material 
at that location in the middle of January. So as they construct it, we are working through methods to where they can open up one, one part of the, of the site to start receiving material again so we can produce as many days as possible of that, uh, of that the hazards that are on the ground in, in uh, Lahaina. The, as I mentioned, the location, again, in, in the, the cinder, cinder pits in Oluwalu, um, as you drive by, you can see that you can see the trucks that have been turning up uh, up there, right, it's right up uphill from the current recycle center there. Um, really just, uh, again, as you drive past on the highway, um, that as this construction continues, what you can continue to expect to see are construction trucks coming in and out of that location uh, as they work to finish this construction project. It is, again, a temporary debris storage site. It is not the final location for this material. As it is constructed, that the methods being used are for a temporary debris storage site. The, it, will, it will include all, the des, all parts of the design that have been vetted and approved and are completely up to regulation and code for a temporary debris storage site. Full, we have full confidence that as that is built, all those, all those protections are in, will be in place, they are part of the design to ensure that while the material is in this location, all, all risks for it to, to cause additional environmental hazard are mitigated to the maximum extent possible and in accordance with all regulation and law. So again, that, that is what is currently being built at the, at the temporary debris storage site. As we look at this particular location, again, we anticipate debris removal to begin mid-January here in Lahaina and the temporary debris storage site to hopefully be able to start receiving that material uh, in, in mid-January with final, final construction of that being complete in, uh, in early February. Things will start small um, with uh, debris removal. The crews will start as we work to, to establish, and so you'll, you'll see those initial trucks start to come in and start to work, but anticipate in the month to two months after the start of debris removal from Lahaina, the number of crews will expand dramatically so that we can, again, expedite the removal of this material out of, out of Lahaina. Again, throughout the entire process, um, we will continue to communicate, we will continue to listen, we continue to do our very best to work with the county, to work with the community, to mitigate any concerns or risks that, that come up as we complete this work. And I, appreciate, I do appreciate the chance and the opportunity to come and share this with you. We know you've got, your, we've got a, lot, a lot of important questions that we will answer. And again, but I want to say thank you for the chance to come up and share uh, the current plans for the Corps of Engineers part of this important effort. Thank you. We recognize that that's a lot of information. Uh, we fully expect to return to you again before I call up Shane Agawa to talk about um, the next part of our uh, information tonight. We have uh, Wilmot Kahayali'i who wanted to offer a pule for us. Um, so we'll stop here and take a pause before we begin and talk about the um, selection or the move forward on a permanent site. Wilmot. Hey, Kalamai. I didn't want to offer the pule. I was actually put on spot by my sister who said, you need to offer the pule. So uh, just for the benefit of those of you who don't know who I am, Oau o kamaunu kahayali i uahana o ia mai au a kahale o ke awi ke kahayali i o kamoku, hi pu uno kalono maa i kanaka. Now there are 90% of you in this room who don't understand a single word I just said. So this pule is going to be very, very important for you to understand why I'm standing before you at this time. Everybody take a breath. Ready? Begin. Deep breath. Aloha. Only aloha. Only aloha. Hanaho. Deep breath. The word I want you to think about is pu'u honua. Pu'u honua. Aloha pu'u honua. Your third breath. Your breath is going to be hanu ola. Hanu ola. Okay? Ready? Breathe in. Without Hanu Ola. Pu'u Honua is Oluwalu. 
Oluwalu was once a place of refuge, a place where people seeking safety could run to and guaranteed their life would be protected. Hanu Ola. Hanu Ola is the breath of life. It's what makes all of us beautiful, gifted, intelligent contributors to what is unfolding at this time. Sound good? I believe everybody in this room is born beautiful, gifted, intelligent contributors. So let us come together and contribute. Let Aloha prevail. Aloha. Mahalo Anui. Ooh, needed that reset. So now you heard a little bit about the temporary site. I'm going to talk a little bit about the next step. Uh, and I'm going to bring up uh, Shana Gawa, who is the director of the county's uh, Department of Environmental Management. And then from there, we're going to take some questions. So if you have a question, just, you just raise it. Someone from our Kokua crew is going to get it from you. And uh, we printed hundreds of them, so maybe somebody took 10, but you, know, you, can, you can write one, more than one question on top, and then you can always ask more later. Uh, if you just need a piece of paper because you have a question, please do that as well. And uh, j just raise it up and we'll take it from you. So, uh, Shane? Thank you, Mahina. Good evening, everybody. My name is Shane Nagawa. I'm the Director of Environmental Management for the County of Maui. So as Mahina mentioned, our task under our department is to determine a final disposition site for the debris coming from Lahaina. I want to reiterate what Mahina said and that there was some misunderstanding about the Oluwalu site. We have not uh, found the site to be the final site. We are still vetting that through. However, our department's purview is for the health and public health and safety and res environmental responsibility. At the time, the criticalness of the debris being out in Lahaina was paramount, in addition to getting the infrastructure back up. So we were trying to remove the debris mainly for the public's health and safety. Now, tonight I'm gonna speak about the final disposition site, the sites that were vetted through and looked at, our scoring procedure. Um, we're gonna talk about the design a little bit of a containment site. And then at the end, we have a panel of people and experts to help answer questions. So I'll work off of the slides, because um, I had to borrow these reading glasses and the, the slide that I was provided was really small. So I talked about this slide. So this slide here, what we show are different areas that we looked at. So we started off looking at a multitude of areas and then our infrastructure group um, picked the top six locations with our scoring procedures. So the locations are, uh, we have Wahikuli area here. We have the Crater Village area. I uh, believe this is the Bishop Estates on the south side of Lahaina Luna Road. We have the Oluwalu site, which is here, sorry. And then the Ukumehame in the firing range area. And then 
Central Maui Landfill. Now I say six sites. And we're dedicated to listen to the community and that's why we're here, to hear feedback. Since the Oluwalu meeting that we had, one of the statements I made is, our community is made up of a lot of smart people. And I wanna hear if you folks have solutions. And solutions were given to us. So from the original six sites, a community member from Oluwala reached out and suggested a seventh site, which is the quarry near the intersection of Honoipilani and Kuihilani Highway. It's on the Malka side of that coconut stand. So we added that to our list of sites to make it seven. And then there was a recent site that was brought to our attention, which is on the Malka side of the bypass north of the Oluwalu uh, landfill area. So what you see here, and it's very hard to see, I understand, but what's outlined in blue are the different sites that we looked at for a total of eight sites. What you see here is our scoring matrix. These are the different sites that I mentioned on the top. I believe there's eight, yeah, there's eight of them. So the two on the end, um, the one on the bypass is Makilahui and the Hawaiian cement quarry. These are the criteria that we looked at. So, oh, I'm sorry, I need to bear with me because it's cut off here. So we looked at one of the criteria is time to acquire land. As I mentioned, the expeditious removal of the debris out of Lahaina was forefront for us early on. So expeditious land acquisition was a high priority. The state approached us, oh, I gotta hold on to this. Um, sorry, and uh, offered land at the Oluwalu site. We did go to the BLNR hearing and the land was, the management of the land was given to us temporarily with a right of entry. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is proximity to Lahaina. Uh, in dealing with public traffic, public safety, and alternative access. The third criteria, distance to residential, schools, and hospitals, with in parentheses a half mile buffer. The fourth criteria, distance to drinking water. Fifth criteria, surface water management. The next criteria is natural environmental concerns, uh, in, which includes tsunami, flooding, wetlands, seismic, and drinking water source. The next criteria that we scored was adjacent property impacts, downwind issues, etc. What we see here is a color-coded scoring sheet. We did do a numeric one. However, for simplicity and understanding, we converted the numeric scoring to a color-coded here. So the red is um, low, yellow is medium, green is high. So the green scored higher on these aspects, yellow and medium. So as you can see here, the rank, Oluwalu rank number one, Wahikuli ranked number two. Crater Village ranked number three. There was a tie for four between Central Maui Landfill and Okumihame. And sixth was Makila Hui, with seven being Bishop Estates and eighth being the Hawaiian Cement Quarry. Now please keep in mind, there's a multitude of criteria. There's no perfect site. We scored this based on infrastructure, our SMEs being infrastructure related, and for the public health and safety. But there's also other issues with every one of these sites, cultural issues, etc. But this is how we scored it from an infrastructure and public health and safety standpoint. This slide here just shows when we looked at Oluwalu, when we move expeditiously, when that land was offered to us from BLNR, this just shows that there is an access road that's available. There's an existing scale house if needed, uh, so existing infrastructure to control the, and record the weights of the debris coming from Lahaina, and there's also a water source for dust control. 
This next slide here is to clarify. There's been different understandings about phase one, phase two, where it's at. We did work on this. It, it changed over time. We did different iterations. So just to explain this slide, this is an overview of the Oluwalu area. The green here is the existing closed Oluwalu dump site. The purple, as you can see here, is the final, the proposed final debris disposition site. So this purple is under the county purview. What you see here in yellow is what Colonel Curry talked about, which is the TDS or temporary debris storage area. Oh, and sorry, what you don't see that's not shown here but it's listed is a UIC line, which is an underground injection control line. That line helped us determine the uh, scoring on the different sites. What that line is, it's a demarcation line that marks between a potable water aquifer and a brackish non-potable water aquifer. So sites that are above it rank lower because it's above a drinking water aquifer. Sites as Oluwalu and others that are below the USC line ranked higher because it's above a non-drinking water aquifer or brackish water. Uh, this is a duplicate slide of the one I just showed you. Okay, so this slide had a lot of interest from the people and it's very technical. So this is a general cutaway version of what a proposed landfill would look like. So as you can see here, this shaded area would be the ash and debris. It's sloped with a flat bottom, both sides. It's a double liner, meaning there's two lines, uh, liners of HDPE material. The Central Maui landfill, which is classified as a Subtitle D landfill, only has one layer of liner. This one has dual layers. The green dots are monitoring for leachate and also a mitigation measure. If leachate is determined in the upper layer, we have a way to pump it out, filter it, dispose of it properly. There's a secondary layer to monitor and mitigate. And there's also a bottom layer that I'll show you in the next slide, um, how to uh, slow the process of infiltration into the groundwater. The top layer is comprised of a final cover composite liner, which is a, a liner designed to be impermeable. There's a system that sheds the water off of the top away from the debris. There were concerns from the community about percolation through the liner, through the soil cover, through the ash, creating leachate. This top liner is designed to shed the water. So water is not, uh, it's a low, very low probability of getting to the ash and then creating leachate where this system would be needed to monitor and mitigate. What you cannot see offside is we have a gas monitoring well. It monitors gas at the site if any gases are created from the debris. And on the other side, which is cut off, we also have groundwater monitoring wells. And one of the reasons why the Oluwalu site ranked high is there is the existing closed rubbish dump. That dump, the perimeter of it, has existing groundwater monitors that monitors water coming from the Malka site through the dump location and monitors on the Makai site. So if any, we call it hits. If anything gets into the groundwater, it causes positive hits. And we'll catch it with comparing the, the down stream side versus the upstream side. And we will have the same monitoring for the proposed final disposition site, wherever they, that may be. Now this is another very important slide. One of the questions I've been hearing is, or concerns I've been hearing is, the native soil in the Oluwalu site is made out of cinder, very porous. That is true, cinder is porous. but. In addition to the two different layers of HDPE liner, 80 mil liner, which you see here in red, 
Now picture this being the bottom of this containment site and you cut away a section of the bottom of the site. The top two feet is cover soil. Then you have another feet of gravel that's encapsulated in 16 ounce geotextile fabric. The geotextile fabric pre prevents particles from filtering down through the gravel and continuing down into the groundwater. Then you have your HDP liner, your first layer. As I mentioned, there's two. After the one foot of gravel, you have one foot of low permeability soil. Another geotextile liner here. You have one foot of sand. The second layer of 80 mil HDP liner. So this is the, sec the two HDP liners I talked about. And then you have another three feet of low permeable soil for a total of eight feet of section. So it's not that the, the, the liner is right on the cinder. This is all designed so that there's no infiltration to groundwater. And just for comparison, this is a standard door height of six feet, eight inches. And this typical section at the bottom of this containment site is eight feet thick. So this slide pertains to the activity from the TDS site to the final containment site. So as the colonel mentioned, there is a system called burrito wrapping. So this upper picture here, you see a semi-truck. The plastic liner is draped on the, around the truck, in the bed of the truck. Debris is put into the bed. It's wetted down. You see the sprayer here. It can be hand sprayed. It's wetted down to control dust. The flap plastics are flapped over, creating a, debris, a burrito type wrapping. And then an adhes adhesive is used to seal the, the joint. On top of that, another tarp is draped over prior to transport. This picture is just showing a convoy of trucks transporting the burrito wraps. Here are two different air quality monitors. One is stationary, one is handheld. The one I've seen being used in Kula is like this tripod where it's strategically placed around certain locations. So for wherever the final disposition site, you would have one upwind, one downwind, and strategically placed around the site. The ones up in Kula, I didn't see this handheld. I saw ones that are clipped on to the, the workers who are working. If the air quality gets bad, alarm beeps, work stops, people are notified, and once it's cleared, work will continue. And I believe that's all the slides I have for presentation, and then Mahina will take care of the Q&A Q session. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Some of you are uh, asking about the slides, the photo. So on Facebook, we have it running separately. It's really clear, you can see it there. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna read. We have a lot of questions that came through, so mahalo. And if you are writing something, just raise it and one of our kokuoku will grab it. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, EE, -E, uh, you folks, when people raise their hand. Um, we just want to know, uh, disregard the pink blue sheet because it looks like everybody was writing on any of them. Facebook, uh, if you're watching via Facebook live stream, you can type your question in. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. We've got dozens and dozens of questions here as well. And for comments on Mana'o later, you are welcome and we encourage you and invite you to send it to mayors.office at mauicounty.gov. Uh, and in the subject, you can just put debris cleanup. And we'll do our best to get to those as well. So um, I just want to make sure your microphones work. Uh, we have our sound. Okay. We also have a backup resource panel <laughs> there on the side. Daniel Arnellis from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Robin Shishido from the, you're the deputy director, Maui boy, in charge of uh, the whole state side. Um, deputy director of transportation. Uh, we have from our public works department, John Smith in the back there. We have Bob Fenton from FEMA. 
we have um, Sage and Mike Kehano, Sage Kiyonaga and Mike Kehano, it's like a name test, uh, from our Department of Environmental Management to help. So I'm going to read off some of these questions. We're going to ask the particular person that can help. Many of you ask duplicate questions. So if we don't read it, it could be that we covered it anyway. Um, so the first question, I found it very interesting. Um, I think, Shane, you might be able to answer this one. It is, why not take the debris to Kaho'olawe? It's already been used as an island, as a chemical nuclear waste site, part of Hawaiian Islands. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure if that's actually Shane or Army Corps. Okay. You want to take a stab? Testing. That's a very good question, and I have to admit, we did not look at Kahoalave um, expeditiously. It would affect the expeditious removal from Lahaina. However, we are still open to op uh, options and suggestions. As I mentioned in the two different sites that was brought to our attention recently that we added to the matrix, we can take a look at that. So. I unfortunately cannot answer if it's possible, but we can take a look at that. Thank you. And if you have Manao on that, um, please send that in as well. Um, I can see folks reacting to that um, for specific to Kaholabe. Again, if you have, uh, I see some question sheets in the front row, Josh. All right. Why not take the debris off island as originally suggested We'll let Shane Ogawa answer that one. So to reiterate the reasons of not taking it off island, there's a multitude of reasons. One and not the only and main reason is cost. It has been stated by some of the community that taking it off island would cost $1 billion. That is not correct. The cost that was made aware to us to handle the debris on island was a billion dollars, one billion dollars. The cost, estimated cost to take it off of Maui, out of state, is four billion dollars. Now what's more critical than the cost is the time. The time to take the debris off island will take approximately three years. On top of that, you need to create another TDS site at a major harbor that is designed to take that kind of design vessel so a TDS site would have to be created near Kahului Harbor. How you do that in a metropolitan area, I, I really don't have the answer for that now. But shipping it off island has a lot of, of hurdles and there's logistic reasons about going from Lahaina by truck. One of the main issues we have that ties into the criteria of public health and safety is the truck loads. 400,000 cubic yards of debris will take approximately 40,000 semi-truck loads being trucked. Now imagine that going over the poly, whale season, um, that is all wrapped up into public health and safety and was wrapped up into the way we scored certain sites. Now if we ship it off island, that still comes into play. It needs to be trucked from Lahaina to Kahului site to a TDS site, rehandled to be put on a ship taken to the continental U.S. is my assumption, taken into a railway, railroad, rail to a location, rehandled into another truck, and then taken to a site. So logistically, there's a lot of logistically, uh, logistic hurdles as well as cost and time. But the main concern is the three years. Three years of having the debris left on the land in Lahaina. Thank you, Shane. Our next question is for the Department of Public Works, uh, who will call up, and maybe John, you can join us here at the table in case there are other questions. This question for County's Public Works. During the debris removal until, oh, will the property owners be allowed to sift through, oh, I'm sorry, that's not you. Don't give me one I can't I know, I'm gonna give you the wrong one. I know I saw one for you. Hang on a second, here. 
After the debris is removed, can we rebuild our house right away? If not, how long does it take? Okay, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I'm here in, on behalf of Jordan uh, Molina, Director of Public Works. He, he was here last week and pointed everyone to the Maui Recovers website. So there's a bunch of frequently asked questions on that site about rebuilding. But um, the short answer is um, your building permit will be given an expedited review process either now if you want to submit or um, in the future we're setting up a expedited permit path by a consultant that's separate from the current process but will still follow the same um, MAPS program. Thank you, John. Yep. You can stay there, so just, there was a seat for you. The next question is for Colonel Curry. Uh, when do you start removing the debris? How long is the process of removal? Um, and are there any steps being taken to speed up that process, Colonel? Yeah, thank you. So as I said during the earlier brief, I mean, every, pro every pr property is unique. Uh, you know, I think so we do have some averages that are out there. I mean, for the majority of the sizes of the, the, the parcels in Lahaina, so speaking particularly about residential, you know, those, those properties will take, you know, three to five days potentially. Um, the smaller ones may be less if there's not a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, metals and other recyclables that also have to be taken off first. So you know, we shoot for that about three-day window uh, for that to be that to be done. Um, as we look, you know, at the question, the part of the question about what can we do to make that faster, the, how we make that faster is we we maximize the absolute number of crews that are they're operating at once. So to reduce that number of time on an individual property, to do it safely and appropriately, is, that's probably as fast as it can be done. But the goal is to mobilize as many crews as possible at once so that we can be addressing as many properties at the same time as possible. And then for the, the long the long term goal there is to be done as early as it, it can be done. Can you hang on to that microphone? This might apply to you. During debris removal, will the owners be allowed to sift through the remaining ash for valuables while your operations are going on? So typically the answer to that question is no. Um, now, what, what we're committed to do in this process is for, for, so for every owner, when if you've submitted a right of entry and when the, the planning comes to that particular property, those, those owners will receive a phone call 72 hours prior to the start of their property. That's, that, that 72 hours is not only to let you know it's gonna happen in three days, but it's also to provide opportunity to discuss with you, to, to, to ensure that we are communicating with you what potential sensitive things might still be on your property that we can help address as we remove the debris. And you know, I, I, I can guarantee you that the, those crews that are out there working, the, the cultural observers, all those, all those people working on site are gonna bend over backwards because most of them, almost all of them, are going to be from from Maui. They are they are parts of these communities. They they want to give you those types of opportunities. There will be safety safety precautions that have to be put in place. What we have done in in other responses are again a part of that communication. If there's valuables and you think you they, you, you may have, during reentry looked for them and not been able to find them, you know communicate that. To the, to the crew that's gonna be working on your property. And those with all the right protective gear can potentially go and sift through that area and look for that on your behalf. Um, again, that, that is what we have done in other, other properties to protect um, because it, again, it, is a, it is a, a, will be a dangerous environment. Um, but again, to try to meet in the middle so that we can, we can hopefully help you find what you're looking for uh, on that property, but also get the work done. Again, every property is different, every pro property is unique, and so, but what won't be different or unique is that we will, we will do our best to have those conversations and accommodate where we can. Thank you. This question is again for you, Colonel Curry. It actually has your name on it. 
Uh, the writers say certain metals, once liquefied or melted into soil, can seep into 18 inches into the soil. Um, how does the Army Corps plan to remove toxic meta melted metals that are deeper than 12 inches? So I think I would probably say that you know, we've gotten similar questions in the past and the experience from multiple other fire events that the Corps of Engineers and FEMA have responded to would indicate that that is not, that is not actually accurate. Um, so as we look at those properties, the, the best science that we have in place and from those experiences indicate that you know, that six inch scrape is in most cases is gonna, reduce, is gonna remove all the contaminants and then definitely to that 12 inch, 12 inch scrape We'll, we'll absolutely remove all those contaminants. That, that is, again, based on uh, the science that has been learned through all the other events that our teams um, have been a part of and are applying to the best effect possible here in Lahaina. Thank you. Still on Army Corps of Engineers, uh, we also know online they're having a hard time picking up the sound off of these. So, gentlemen, I'm going to hand you this mic because it has the uh, online connection. Uh, the question, Colonel, is how can a right of entry be modified due to the findings by a structural engineer pertaining to retaining walls? So can an ROE be modified um, if an engineer finds uh, retaining walls? So as the ROE is completed, again, we ask those owners to indicate those parts of their property that we need to pay extra close attention to. Retaining walls has been one of those that as we've received ROEs, a lot of questions and a lot of, a lot of discussion on how each one would potentially be, be taken care of. Will it be removed? Will it not be removed? Typically, so if a retaining wall is within the ash footprint, so it was compromised by that fire of that structure, in, in most cases, again, those retaining walls are no longer structurally sound and would need to be removed. Um, if it's outside the ash footprint, outside what was directly impacted by that, that ash or that fire from the structure, then typically those will not be removed. All that said, as you indicate that on your property, because again, lots of, lots of unique situations, that is part of that discussion that you need to have uh, with the crews that are gonna be removing. If, if there's, if there's an indication from, from an engineer saying that that retaining wall is, is, is solid, I can tell you that if it's within the ash footprint, it's probably still going to be removed. Um, because, again, that's, that's ultimately how we have to reduce that risk to all homeowners for you to be able to get your permits to be able to rebuild. Um, but have those conversations so that we can make sure we are absolutely making the right decisions as we, we take action on your properties. Thank you. This question is for FEMA. Uh, apparently there's um, individuals having a hard time with their insurance because their policy does not have debris removal in it. Uh, it what is FEMA's advice for those who are having a hard time getting their insurance uh, over and over? So, appreciate the question. I know that's important to you. Uh, our public assistance guidance specific to insurance and private property debris removal pertains to uh, we cannot support duplication of efforts. Okay, now the state and county will have to take a look at the policies and make determinations on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are a few examples I can give you that further illustrate, uh, you know, many of the situations, okay? So, two items. One is that if you have a debris removal specific parameter to your policy, the county will collect those monies, okay? because otherwise that would be a duplication of benefits. And the second one is a little bit impractical, if you will, and, but I'll, let me go ahead and say it, is that after you've uh, used your insurance monies to reconstruct your home, 
if there are any leftover funds, the county will collect that too. But you know that's not very practical because I would imagine that you know you will use every dime to foster reconstruction. Okay. I hope that helps. I feel like I'm stalking you folks with all these questions. Uh, this is for Shane Agawa. The question is, I heard many good speakers at the Native Hawaiian Convention on Vai and Aina bioremediation. Uh, they had eco-friendly solutions for the waste. And have we considered any of those type of um, alternatives? This, this. So thank you for that question. We have looked at it. We went, I went personally to a presentation, a whole group of us went to a presentation regarding bioremediation. That is one of the things we can look at. Um, it was posed to line the final containment site with a bioremediation substance, which would help bring, break down the toxicity of the ash and debris. I don't know what the cost of that is associated with, with that remediation, but we have been talking about that. Recently, I've also been talking with someone who has some experience with a biofiltration mesh, I believe is the, the term. Um, I apologize if I get that wrong. Um, that is to help filter out possible toxins from any leachate that is created into groundwater. Um, at this point, no solution is ruled out. Um, I'm willing, our team is willing to, to look at different solutions. But yes, we have been in talks with different developers on bioremediation. Thank you, Shane. We're, we're going to use these two since they're rigged for the social media camera. Uh, this is for Army Corps of Engineers. What is the process to determine the order of removal? Yes, thank you. It's a really good question. So the, the order of the removal is primarily, initially, it's based on guidance from, you know, coordination with the county. And, you know, those, those priority zones, the priority one of those is life and health safety. So those properties that are closest to existing structures, to parts of Lahaina that people, you know, are, are currently residing or could reside in the near future um, is to protect against those. So that, that priority is part of the evaluation process for where the debris removal will start. Second to that is environmental risk. So those, those part properties that are close to parts of Lahaina that, again, if that, if that debris were to, to, be, to break free from, from that, that particular spot would cause the greatest risk to the environment. So those two, those two priorities really are what we will start with. I, I will say that as the rights of entry are received, there will be, you know, the third priority, and even within those two priorities, uh, we'll, we'll have to determine what is the most effective way or most efficient way for the contractor to mobilize uh, throughout Lahaina. So the, we, we typically will gravitate towards those neighborhoods that have the most complete number of ROEs in them so that, as you can imagine, crews can just go from one property to the next door property to the next door property, and that will be the most efficient way as opposed to having to fully pull up their operations and move somewhere across town. Um, so, you know, an encouragement for communities to continue to talk to their neighbors and make sure that they are looking into the, to being a part of the, the federal program because that will also impact where within those neighborhoods uh, we, we focus that effort. Thank you. Colonel, can you uh, address dust control while offloading? Absolutely. So uh, addressing dust control, the, the methods that we you have utilized so far very successfully in Kula have been very, very important to inform and continue to help us to refine the dust control process uh, that we are anticipating uh, putting into place in Lahaina. So as you saw from some of the pictures, we will use uh, wet methods. You know, prior to us uh, getting onto these properties, uh, soil tack has been, has been applied. Uh, but once we start that process to start removing, uh, de removing that debris, then we will continually be using wet methods in order to keep that ash and dust from getting into the air. 
if, if you watch them do it every scoop there's there's an individual there spraying that spraying where they're gonna scoop and spraying the scoop as it comes out as that material goes into the truck it will be additionally wetted down and maintained that as as it does that the again I talked about the burrito wrap and encapsulating to trying to hold that water uh, in place because that water is now part of it and that will stay encapsulated um, but again that process as it moves forward to date has been very successful at maintaining maintaining the dust from getting into the air um, I would probably add to the and it started wasn't exactly asked in the question throughout this process we will have layered monitoring and that's active monitoring every individual on the site is going to have a monitor on their person immediately at the at the edges of the property will be an active monitor that is going to be watched so if that monitor uh, triggers any th type of thing that would be concerning all operations stop and they determine okay what what is happening do we need to adjust how we're adding how we're how we're, we are uh, spraying wh whatever the conditions are they will adjust to address that what was ever causing that monitor to go off and even beyond that there's a third layer of monitor that is placed you know according to wherever the wind is blowing that day um, it, it really should never get to that third layer of monitoring but that said we'll continue to ensure that that dust and ash is controlled throughout the process so the I think we're going to stick to the questions on the card, sir. Sound check. Um, Colonel, hold on to that microphone. We have some questions with that we'll ask. Uh, for properties with a swimming pool on their, on their parcel in the backyard, uh, how will the debris be removed from the swimming pools? Yes, so uh, for, for swimming pools um, and those types of unique structures within, typically if those swimming pools are not immediately in the ash footprint, and they're structurally sound and they will not be removed. Um, you know, there's other things on your property that, you know, we also want to make sure, again, are on that right of entry that we are aware of things like, you know, septic systems, cesspools, again, that will be important for us to understand as we do the work. But again, typically, unless that swimming pool is within the ash footprint and is damaged, then those, that the swimming pool would not be removed. Thank you, Colonel. This one is both question and comment, but I'm going to give it the, the, the reading for it because it's so important. And it says, why has nothing been said tonight about respecting the human remains that are in the ash? So previously we talked about human remains in the ash. Uh, we also talked about temples and churches that have lost urns, as well as families who had uh, their loved ones in ashes there. So that question was... Um, and the paper also says most people in this room lost loved ones in the fire. It would be terrible disrespectful to combine these human ashes with debris and dump them somewhere. So looking for a better idea, more time, more respect, uh, and it would be to keep that in mind. So out of respect for the families, I did want to share that. I have a question here raised. Thank you. All right. Let's go back to the questions here. Um, why were heavy equipment used on properties in phase one, in the beginning stage of phase one, without owners being notified or permission given? Uh, so was there equipment used without owner's permission, uh, and, and did we? I can take that. So for phase one hazardous material removal efforts, the authority is forwarded by the emergency proclamation from the state. There are no rights of entry associated with that, that part of the mission. And um, what was the rest of the question? Did we use heavy equipment without oh. uh, owners being notified yeah. or permission? Thank you, Mahina. Uh, no. So that is really a by hand mission, uh, non intrusive, all done by hand, and it's typically limited to about three hours worth of work. Thank you. Uh, my, I see that that person also wrote a comment that maybe we can answer later that regarding uh, your mom's ashes that was part of that property. Is it the, the 
Okay, so I saw it come in on the card. So the question about the what, what the air monitors are testing for. So certainly would ask you know to to address you know probably afterwards is some of the if you want to get into the specific sciences of things, but ultimately all of our air monitors are testing for everything that is approved and directed by the Department of Health. And our, our results go to the Department of Health. We will follow in accordance with what they ask us, what our monitors are supposed to be one for. So I know it, it is again back into the science more scientific side of it. You know, we're te testing for heavy metals is the is the main main pieces that are being tested for all in accordance with what the Department of Health has directed. Now, is there a protocol for recycling concrete with potential dioxin leaching? Is there a protocol for recycling concrete that may have the potential for dioxin leaching? So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to the question at this time. For a, a protocol for, for concrete? I do, I do. Yeah. Um, but uh, again, I don't have that answer this time. We can certainly take that question and we'll look to put that information okay. out at a future public meeting or directly to the, those that need to know. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Shane. Please explain the bill before the County Council, also known as Bill 120, that will be heard this Friday at Council. What does a no vote mean and what does a yes vote mean? What if it passes or doesn't pass? Okay, so to answer the question, Bill 120 refers to the right of entry from BLNR to the county. If you folks remember, Bill 119 was a bill for an emergency ordinance to allow management of the Oluwalu site. That is what the Army Corps is working under. It is only a temporary right of entry for 90 days. What Bill 120 allows is if a, uh, so to answer the specific question, if a no vote is given on Bill 120, then on the 91st day, the Army Corps needs to cease and desist any activity at Oluwalu, meaning debris from Lahaina will not be able to get to a temporary storage site. If the vote is yes, the right of entry allows us to have land management for one year with an extension or until the executive order from the governor allows us final management of the Oluwalu property. Now, how, why that is important is that it extends the operating time frame for Army Corps to continue to take the debris off the lands, off people's property, and get it to the TDS site. I just want to clarify that a yes vote for Bill 120 does not finalize Oluwalu as the final containment site. It just allows a one-year time frame for the right of entry between the state and the county, and then between the county and Army Corps to continue debris removal from Lahaina. Thank you, Shane. I'm not sure this is public works. Uh, what are we going to do for people who are living in their homes but have burned dwellings surrounding them? Is that Army Corps or public works? I I think it goes back to the priorities. So I think Colonel Curry already spoke to it that those will be the highest priority areas for the debris mission. The next question is, are you going to fill up and cap the cesspools in Waihikuli District? Who's handling cesspool questions? This is that junk in home moment. Yeah, so I, I don't, I think, I'm uh -huh. not sure this is exactly the question, but if, okay. if it's the question is about cesspools that are located on an existing property that we are doing debris removal at, I mean, yes. yeah, the intent is for us not to touch those. Um, ultimately, we want to know where they are because of the equipment that's going to be moving on the property, and we don't want to drive over someone's uh, cesspool. Um, but again, th those should not be disturbed on those properties. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, Shane, this might be for you. Who authorized the Oluwalu site? Who authorized the Oluwalu site for temporary and as a potential permanent? So the authorization of the Oluwalu site for the temporary was 
originally between BLNR to the county. So that gave us a right of entry, temporary, as I mentioned before. Then it was an agreement between the county and Army Corps through a license agreement to utilize the site for the TDS. And I stress, again, the importance of public health and safety to get the debris off of the lands at Lahaina to a storage facility. Question for Army Corps or Shane. Uh, how long is temporary? How temporary is temporary and how long do we anticipate that? So there's no real numerical answer to this. Temporary means, I see some people laughing, but temporary is temporary until a final disposition site has been determined. Now you think about it, right? If a final disposition site has not been determined, the debris has nowhere to go for its final resting place. That's why I cannot give a numerical, I cannot say three years, I cannot say four years, I cannot say six months. So, if it's temporary, it's as long as it takes to get to a final containment site, wherever that may be. Thank you, Shane. Here is the question, not sure who, might be FEMA or Army Corps. Um, how long, or how long did it take other landfills with toxic debris on the mainland to be built? Do we know that? Are the examples of how long? Want to answer, Bob? So, uh, as Bob indicated, um, residential debris associated with fires is um, exempt from Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. We we have, um, you know, what we're used to in California, for example, where we've had eight fires in the last 10 years is uh, that debris has been able to go to regular subtitle D landfills. Does that answer the question? As best as you could. Okay, thanks. Uh, Shane, this might be for you. Well, actually it's for FEMA. Will FEMA help Hawaii pay for the final disp disposition of the ash and debris? Good question. So, you know, we uh, are very heavily involved in the construction of the temporary debris storage site. We will uh, also fund uh, the transportation from the TDS site to the permanent site, including tipping fees. Thank you. Who will make the decision for Shane? Who will make the decision about which location or choice is made for the final disposition site? Since it's the final goes to the County of Maui, how is that process? So the final site would be determined one, as I mentioned, our scoring from the infrastructure group. However, as I also mentioned, that's not the only criteria. We as infrastructure people can only speak on infrastructure, public health and safety, environmental concerns criteria. As I mentioned, there's other factors that I am not an expert on. So the final determination would be a collaboration between infrastructure, I would assume mayor's office, and the community. Thank you, Shane. For Army Corps of Engineers, concerning the burrito, how is the burrito, I'm sorry, the word's gonna sick on me, how is the burrito deposited onto the site and removed from the truck? Like what equipment, what process? Yeah, so the, the burrito itself, I mean, for most of those trucks is just simply dumped, you know, onto its site. And it will be, heavy equipment will be used to move it around. But the, the key point there being is once it's in the temporary debris storage site, I mean, that burrito is not necessarily need, does not necessarily need to remain intact. Um, as, as it goes in place, again, that plastic will be there, but um, again, it, it, it may come open, it may, it may, it, but that's not part of the necessary protections that are part, are built into the design of the storage site. When that material is then moved out of the temporary de debris storage site, it will be rewrapped and will be again handled the exact same way to ensure that as it moves, um, especially if it has to move a long distance, 
that it, uh, it is still protected to the same level it was coming out of Lahaina. Thank you, sir. Just to add to that, uh, the, the idea of the burrito wrap is really to mitigate uh, dust migration from point A to point B during transportation. A question for Public Works. At what point will we be clear to go and build if we already have a building permit? How will people be notified? Um, once the debris mission is complete, um, the Corps of Engineers will notify the county that the mission is complete through an electronic process that will actually show up um, on your electronic uh, in, in the electronic system, the map system. So the county will get a notification that that process has been cleared. At that point, it's um, back to you. And then you can apply for your permit, or you can apply for your permit beforehand, but then at that point you can start building. Thank you. I'm not sure if any of you can answer this one. It might be more on a bigger scale. Will there be uh, a time where the land can rest after the debris is removed? Is there a pause, or do we go straight into the next phase? I think that's Office of Recovery. Sounds like it. Okay. We have been at it for about almost an hour and a half. We're going to keep going a little bit. Um, I will tell you that some of you wrote multiple questions in order to give other people a chance to ask questions. We've been skipping back and forth. If your question was not asked tonight, we're going to run a list of questions and provide answers um, available on our website. So I just want to make sure you know that these questions will not be unanswered. Some will not be answered this evening, uh, just in the interest of time and respect it being a work night as well. Next question is, have we uh, tried or considered something called biochar for cleanup? Okay, sounds like an alternative that not. Okay, all right, we'll let that one go. I'm going to take that as a no, uh, but maybe our team can take a look at one. Why is that? It's a, we're willing to consider it, take a look at it. The fact that they don't know the answer this second, uh, we do not want them to guess or speculate. So we'll go ahead. I think they just are comparing, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for your respect. As Colonel Curry indicated earlier, our objective is to take the ash and debris from uncontrolled environments in the communities to controlled environments in the, both the temporary debris storage site as well as the final disposition site. There's a question about human remains. Is it possible to separately collect uh, culturally significant areas of known or known human remains where they were found and in turn it separate from the rest of the debris? Very difficult in all the uh, debris. Has that been looked at or considered? So I can speak on, on behalf of what the task that the Corps of Engineers has is again our our monitors or observers on site are that that's the reason one of the reasons that they're there um, is to ensure that any any human remains whether they're you know ancestral human remains or they're as a as a result of, of this terrible event you know are handled appropriately um, you know as as the, that debris is removed I mean again the, there will be immediate if any of that is identified immediate stoppage and then those similar to what was done during the search and rescue phase, a determination will be made as to really what, what the next steps need to be. If uh, for particular on properties where those types of things occur, that will, we will take the necessary time uh, to receive those answers and those decisions won't be made by the Corps of Engineers or the, the folks on the, that are doing the debris removal. They will be made by those officials that are, that that's their job to make those decisions. Thank you, Colonel. We are headed to 7.30. Uh, Mayor informed me that we are going to welcome two uh, com comments from two individuals, Eddie Garcia and Paele. Uh, I know they're here. Eddie, I see you here. 
Foggy saw you there. Um, Paele, are you still here? I, I saw him earlier. Okay, we are definitely going to take the questions for later as well and run a list, but Eddie, out of respect for time as well, if you could keep it uh, concise and brief, I'm told you wanted to share some information. And Paele, if you're here, but Jordan, do you know where Paele went? Okay. He was here. Then we're going to take the rest of the questions that people are turning in and then go back and, and go ahead and uh, start to put those uh, questions somewhere where we can provide some responses to them because it could be questions that others have. Since then, we have found the FEMA guy that said it and is saying it publicly and confirming it. So we know that's one option. So let's, on my paper right here, I have brought one of the changers in the world right here. Um, Brittany, she worked for NASA for many years. She has a solution that include, includes a very advanced form of pyrolization. Pyrolization is what they mentioned earlier as biochar. Pyrolization has the potential to actually take every bit of material out of this fire, including the PVC pipe and the dioxins, and turn it into an inert material that can be sealed in concrete. This has been done in Japan with tires for many years. This technology exists. I don't think that it has been put forward to the county yet or anyone is aware of it. I also think that most people are unaware of the toxicity of PVC pipe. My place burned and I have not gotten any information or any help on, for instance, I spoke to certain people that I told them that the sheathing on the electrical and cable lines was made out of PVC and that it's dripped onto the concrete, which we know leaches into concrete. There's a lot of science to back this up. So none of us should be touching anything PVC, electric wires or anything else. And I, we can prove it with the science that the monitors these folks are talking about on the cars do not test dioxin. They don't have that capability. There are very complex tests with um, uh, gas spectrometers and whatnot. Um, and very few labs that are actually able to do it. So to say that we can just send people in with a hazmat suit and no one talks about dioxins or furon. These are known as the dirty dozen, the forever chemicals. You can write any link into this and you will be educated to this. So why are we being told that we can go into Lahaina that I am not gonna get any help from FEMA on my farm because there was no house on it, yet all of it's covered with the sheathing of cable lines that are from uh, the cable companies. The county says, oh, the electric company told us there's no dioxins anywhere because they were only aware of them in the transformers. No one's paying attention to all the PVC material that's melted everywhere. This is a high candidate for dioxins. So we know that we have to deal with that. 
the only technology on the planet right now that can deal with this as a whole is some of these pyrolysis, gasification, and some of the other processes around the planet where they are burning trash and turning it into non-toxic material. So we know that this exists, and at some point right here, I'd like them to allow Brittany to come up here and talk about one of the solutions that we've put up. Um, or somehow for the county, we think that that meeting has to be deferred for at least for you guys to consider it. If there is any chance that it would work and that we could actually not have to take any of this off the island and, oh yeah, and that we could get it to a place where it could actually be benign and not actually affect anything, shouldn't we explore those options? Should we decide? On, on a permanent site before we have exhausted all of our options. I have something else on here, and on that scan, you guys should all get it. Because on the back side of this dump site, there is a very simple cinder wall. I have been there every day filming with the drones for all week since they started. We can also show that some of the core Army engineers right here, that you guys are actually working within the TMK of the permanent site and you guys are not allowed to be doing any grading there. In fact, you told uh, Shane that you were not doing any grading any there. We can prove that wrong by an overlay of the TMKs. So whether you're doing it on purpose or out of ignorance, it is happening. This is not on the county. This is directly on the Corps of Engineers. So that is their responsibility. In my eyes, the county has actually been trying to do their job and their due diligence on this. They are not being educated by the EPA has it, ever, has it ever been brought to your attention so that if you pick up PVC in Lahaina that it's toxic and can kill you 40 years down the road and what the complications of that are? I think that many people are unaware of that. And I think that's really important to be addressed. If it's not addressed, we're going to be killing our grandchildren 40 years down the road. You can't see these chemicals. You can't taste them, touch them, smell them. But they will absorb into your body. Um, the, uh, so the scientists should be saying this, and I ask my community to, to demand that this does not get passed without the proper uh, ex exhaustion, excuse me, of all the resources to be able to do complete tests for dioxin, furons, to educate our public to that you cannot go on your property and pick up PVC pipe. Eddie, I'm going to let... Okay, Ellie, have a chance to speak as well. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you, Eddie. It's up to you guys to put it forward. Call them up. Hello, guys. Sorry, I'm very unprepared. I wasn't fully really aware that I would be presenting, but we did, as Lahaina Strong, take it upon ourselves to conduct a survey so that the data that we gather is undeniable of what the community actually wants. And we have a massive database of people that we had signed up with for our initial petition to delay the reopening of West Maui. And we blasted it to, we had about almost 5,000 emails that we sent this survey out to. And we sent that out yesterday uh, to do with this, this issue right now. And we have at 834 uh, people that filled out the survey. So I can share some of that information with you guys. And this information I'll actually be sharing with our county so that they know exactly what our people want. So one of the questions or the, the statements that we had people um, fill out was, I support using established landfills and considering options to remove debris from the island over new sites for wildfire debris management. The community spoke. 537, which is 65% of the people who took this survey strongly agreed, and 18% agreed. So the vast majority of people agreed on that. This question dealt with handling human remains. Should we separate human remains and ash from the rest of the debris? 65% of, the people, 65 of our community agreed with that, strongly agreed. Another 15% agreed. Um, something that I spoke with Shane about uh, last week was conducting a baseline water study so we know where exactly where we're at now so that when we start doing debris management, 
we can see the, the fluctuation in the toxicity levels of the water in that area. So this question was, do you believe that conducting a baseline water quality study before debris management is essential to safeguard environmental health? 98% of everybody agreed on that. Um, should alternative solutions for wildfire debris management be explored to minimize environmental impact? 97% of our people that took the survey agreed. Would you support the creation of an encapsulated monument in Lahaina for respectful commemoration of human remains from the wildfire? 94% of the people agree with that. And then there was another section for the management of the wildfire debris I would prefer, and there were a list of options. So one of the options were to remove of debris from the island completely. And I also included on there that it is very costly, so people had that in mind. 47% of you agreed. Uh, the Omao Pio landfill, which is the central Maui landfill, I should, I should have been more clear about that because people were a little bit skeptical of that Omao Pio. But another 36% of you, you agreed upon that. So the vast majority of the people don't want it in line. Long story short. And then, yeah, there's, there's parts in here just to make sure that everybody who answered these questions were part of the line of community. So there's a demographic area. So um, yeah, those are things and we're gonna keep this survey open. And I can speak with my team to make sure that this survey is readily available for more people who want to take it. And we can get this information to them. And we have the luxury of being able to have this database that we can access to speak to as many of you as possible. So that, you know, there are what, two, 300 people here tonight. Well, there's another 800 people that we can account for too. So, mahalo. Thank you, Kaya. Before, before I ask Mayor to close out this evening, I just want to say tomorrow night we're in Kula. Every week we're up there, and then Wednesday night we'll be back here. We'll be taking our break from weekly meetings uh, and ahead of January. So Mayor Bisson, if he can um, offer some closing. Okay. Mahalo, Uncle. You, you want us to have somebody else say something? Is that what you're saying? I mean, okay. she's wearing so we, her we've been at it. Be, we've been at it for be, 90 minutes. Must be true. So. Aloha, thank you so much for having me. I flew over from the Big Island at the request of a lot of folks here. And um, after watching all of this review, I, I really believe that everybody is doing the very best that they can, right? It's just, what is the best that we can do? And I'm just uh, challenging everybody to think about some additional ways um, that we've utilized for processing waste in other sectors and in other arenas. Um, my background uh, is in engineering, so I, I think it was mentioned earlier before too that I specialize in bioregenerative physiochemical hybrid environmental control and life support systems for long duration space flight. Don't worry about that. Um, I work on keeping people alive and recycling things in a way that is effective in space environments, and I have now re considered how important it is to apply those things here to our very own planet. And that's what I'm here doing. Uh, we're working on the big island right now where we take wastes, including ash wastes, including municipal solid wastes, including heavy toxins, and we process that into a sustainable material. It's a carbon negative concrete that also removes greenhouse gases from the environment in its production. So please. I actually have a bunch of the material here with it. I would just ask for a time um, to uh, have an audience to talk through the deep sciences. Um, we're happy to work with Department of Health, Army Corps, whoever it takes um, to help vet any of this stuff out. But we have 
been making the material, we are currently producing the material, and we would like to help in absolutely any ways that we can. So I invite conversation, and um, I, I did bring some, so if anybody wants to talk afterwards, I will be here um, for as later cut time. Yes, and we're also uh, not asking the county for any money. If you were to exercise any of our help, we're very happy to implement those solutions at cost to us. So, thank you. We uh, are not going to be rushing off here, so our folks will still be here. If you have a question, I'm going to send this over to Mayor Bisson to close tonight, and we thank you and mahalo you uh, for your time. So I want to thank our interpreter who's been working overtime over there to pick up all of this conversation. I want to thank our panel and those who stood by who were happy that they didn't get asked any questions. Um, you know, this was just something we, we wanted to come to the community and get. There's so much talk about what's happening. We just wanted to give you what we know to be happening. And you can decide on this. You know, you can decide in your communities. I appreciate Paele coming up and giving the results. I just wanted to say on a couple of those, I don't know how come it wasn't 100% when it came to the water. I know you guys applauded for the 98. I was concerned about the 2% who didn't think that. I'm, I'm serious. And even when it came to the memorial, 94% thought it was okay. What, what, was the, what did the other 6% think? I mean, I'm just curious. You know, we gotta have these conversations because one of the things we do, you know, as an administration, we're committed to helping our community and answering to our community. But as you can tell, our community has many layers. There are many layers to a community. When you say, oh, you're going to help your people, what people are you talking about? What group? Is everybody on the same page? Does everybody agree? Do we really believe we should take this to Kaho'olawe that has been damaged and destroyed enough in our state? We really think that's, that's the option to go across the ocean risk taking this across the ocean and across the channel, going across Alanui Haha to get it over to Kaholavi. I mean, there's lots of things to talk about. Good ideas, putting out the ideas. Come with the solutions. Come with the so solutions right behind that. And you know, there's lots of ways to get your information. This is just one of the ways. It's not the only way, as you've heard from our other speakers. We're very passionate, right? So a lot of ways you can get your information. We're offering you the folks that we have been, you know, working with, learning from. Um, it's not a perfect situation, you guys. It's not a perfect situation. And, you know, shame was being nice, but I think at the end of the day, I'm going to make that call where we're going to go with this. It's going to fall on me and the advisors that I have, some of the folks that are sitting here right now. But everything we're doing, we're trying to do the best for the most people. Can you do it for all? Can you do it for every single person? I'm not sure if everyone's going to agree with our decision. But we're going to make the best decision for the most people that we think is safe. And again, for our environment, our people, our children, uh, that's our goal. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come back. We'll be here to answer questions. So you guys have more. Thank you, Olawalu. Thank you, Olawalu, for coming out here to line up. Mahalo, you folks.